What's going on YouTube? This is Ray and in this video we will be continuing our video series on White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. In this series we are going to be reviewing and rebutting the arguments in this book chapter by chapter. This book is so is very prominent in our society. It's being pushed in colleges and it's even being pushed in the church unfortunately. So as a Christian I want to go through this book, tear its arguments apart so that as believers you can be empowered to do the same. I hope that this content will be edifying and bring glory to God and hopefully um, we can point to the gospel. And we will be continuing with chapter 2. Alright, so already chapter 2 begins with a an assumption that's true but she treats it like a bad thing. Many of us have been taught to believe that there are differences, distinct biological and gen genetic differences between races. She seems to uh, think that this is a bad thing. In fact, I believe that if we recognize that race is purely you know, genetic and biological, we are incentivized to be less racist as human beings. Um, this is a, in the same way that we are not prejudice against blondes, brunettes, redheads, maybe not entirely redheads, but you know what I mean, that we recognize that this is a genetic thing and we see them as people. Um, we do not define people by their genetics. But she seems to think that, the, that this is a bad thing. She goes on to say below, but race like gender is socially constructed. Now, saying gender is a social construct is already a terrible argument, but the purpose of this video is not to uh, destroy that um, bad argument, but saying race, which is a better argument than saying gender is a social construct, also isn't really true considering there are distinct biological differences in races. And again, this doesn't make this does not make one race more or less superior than another. These are just how it is. She goes on to say, under the skin, there's no true biological, uh, there's no true biological race. Th this is mostly true. We all bleed red, if that's what she's trying to say. So if she tries to go through, uh, American history here. Then below she's quoting a book about reparations. Just important to note here. And then she has she ends this little section with this comment that kind of summarizes her arguments. Kendi goes on to argue that if we truly believe that all humans are equal, then disparity in con in con Condition can only be the result of systemic discrimination. So this is her transition. So she's already establishing that disparity equals racism. Now this isn't true. This is as scientific as saying that correlation equals causation. However, I would argue that sometimes correlation can be a cause can be the result of a causation, but this is not one of those times. So her next little quote here is, race is an evolving idea, is an evolving social idea that was created to legitimize racial inequality to protect white advantage. So she's saying that the concept of race was created to kind of protect itself. So white people created race to protect themselves and to protect whiteness. Um, she kind of goes to say that white w first appeared in colonial law in the late 1600s. Um, she uh, ultimately makes a conclusion that white people invented the concept of race. This is very historically inaccurate. She talks about how in American history, um, courts have ruled in on what is white and, and what is not white, what people groups are white, what people groups aren't white. She takes great offense 
at Japanese people not being declared white, but Armenian people being declared white. I see that as apples and oranges. You can disagree with both of those rulings all you want, but they're not equivalent. So... Because race is a product of social forces, it has manifested itself along class lines. Poor and working class people were not always perceived as fully white. So now she's trying to say that what you might not have been white enough if you were white. If you were genetically white, you weren't white enough. And she's trying to use class as an example of this point. So she's saying that lower class white people aren't fully white. However, poor and working class whites were eventually granted full entry into whiteness as a way to exploit labor. So basically, this is a very Marxist argument here. She's saying that you know, you're allowed to be white so that white people can exploit you. Essentially, she's saying that working class white people are less white than non-working class white people, but they're still white. The poor and working classes, if united across race, would could be a powerful force, but racial, racial divisions have served to keep them from organizing against the owning class who profits from their labor. Now, this is where the uh, Marxism really kicks in. This is a classical Marxism where it's more economically focused. So she's saying that the uh, working class that the concept of whiteness was created to keep working class white people from realizing that they're part of the proletariat. This working class that if united could overthrow the ruling class. She's making a very Marxist argument here and this is not the first time she makes an argument condemning white people um, for not being Marxist enough. She will go on to do this uh, in a later chapter. So here we got a, another uh, big quote here. Unfortunately, the prevailing belief that prejudice is bad causes us to deny its unavoidable reality. So what she's saying here is that our definition of prejudice is bad. And she's saying this because we don't see ourselves as prejudice. So because we don't see ourselves as racially prejudiced, the definition of racially prejudiced is wrong. Now, the beautiful thing about Kindle is you can highlight and see definitions. I believe the second definition is the most applicable here. Dislike, hostility, or unjust behavior deriving from unfounded opinions. And you see below like, accusations of racial prejudice. I think most white people would agree that this is a good definition of prejudice. But she does not agree because she sees it as a, our means of saying that we are not racially prejudiced. So if we have an objective definition to measure ourselves against, we'll find our, that we're not racially prejudiced. And she sees that as a problem. Um, so she says discrimination is an action based off pre prejudice. Um, now, if we look at how she defines discrimination, this isn't all bad, right? The unjust or prejudicial treatment. So it's manifesting itself in action. Prejudice always manifests itself in action because the way I see the world drives my actions in the world. Here she's uh, saying that People cannot be objective. They will always have their prejudice with them. That people cannot put aside their prejudice. So she believes that people cannot act against their own biases, nor mitigate them to make a clear judgment. Now here, in this next section here, this is where she's going to define racism. When a racial group's collective prejudice is backed by power by the power of re legal authority and institutional control, it is transformed into racism. 
And we go on to the next page. She says, similarly, racism like sexism and other forms of oppression occur when a racial group's prejudice is backed by legal authority and institutional control. So she's uh, hammering in her redefinition of racism in her own image. She's setting it up. She's setting her argument up to say that black people cannot be racist. This is where she's going with this argument. And then here she she finally defines racism. She says racism is a system. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the intersectionality of race and gender in the example of suffrage. So she is defining racism as a system. She finally defines racism. It took her until chapter two. Now, I love the fact that Kindle does definitions, like I said before, and I, I just feel like this is a pretty good self-owned racial, racial racism. Prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed towards directed against someone of a different race based off a of belief that one's own race is superior. The belief that all members of each race possess characteristics or abilities specific to that race, especially uh, so as to distinguish it as inferior or superior to another race or races. So, you know, even the Kindle does not acknowledge her uh, definition of racism if you were to highlight it. I feel like that's good self-own. So if we move on, example of um, ideology in the United St States includes individualism, the superiority of capitalism as an economic system, and democracy as a political system, consumerism as a desirable lifestyle, and meritocracy. Anyone can succeed if they just work hard. So she's saying that these um, beliefs that most I, she attributes to white people uphold racism. So systematic racism exists because of these ideologies. Now, I would note that none of these ideologies are necessarily unique to white people. Um, meritocracy is an ancient ideal. Consumerism exists globally. Capitalism is proven to be a superior economic system than socialism. She goes on to say, ideologies that obscure racism as a system of inequality are perhaps the most powerful racial forces because once we accept our own positions within racial hierarchies, these positions seem natural and difficult to question even when we are disadvantaged by them. So, she's already ranted against Western and Christian culture, really. And now she's um, setting up her argument that says, disagreeing with the author means that you are contributing to the most powerful forces of racism. And these forces would be the uh, ones up above, like individualism and uh, capitalism and meritocracy. Those things mean, if upholding those ideals means that you're upholding racism. That's the argument she's trying to make in this section here. Moving on, she says, people of color may also hold prejudice and discriminate against white people, but they lack the social and institutional power that transforms their prejudice and discrimination into racism. So there she's saying black people can't be racist. Now, I would disagree based off this definition of racism. And then she goes on to say the impact of their prejudice on whites is temporary and contextual. So this is a really um, dismissive and insensitive thing to say. So if a white person is killed for being white by, say, a black person, that ex instance of racism is temporary and contextual. You know, it's not, it's trivial to her. She's trivializing the experiences of white people. And this is um, an example of intersectionality, where, where she is rating the experiences based off the... Uh, ideals of postmodernism where we value the experience of individuals as opposed to hard facts and objective truth. So 
We've already valued the, their experiences. That's postmodernism. Now we're rating the experiences of people. That's where intersectionality comes in. She has determined that white people's experiences are inferior on the basis of their race to, say, black people or, as she says, people of color. So their experiences are superior and therefore any racism that white people allege or any prejudice that they experience is really trivial because it doesn't mean as much. This is entirely racist. We must reject and anathemize this way of thinking. Whites hold the institutional positions in society to infuse their racial prejudice into the laws, policies, practices, and norms of society in a, in a way that people of color do not. So this again says that, you know, white people, everything that, laws that white people create are to maintain the systemic racism. But what she does not really go on to do is name a single law that's contemporary that enables this. She just assumes the premise of her argument. She doesn't back it up. Here she goes on to, con she continues on her argument that, you know, people of color cannot be racist. Yet racial disparity between whites and people of color continues to exist in every institution across society. This, again, is an argument that disparity equals racism. The, the data does not support this. Moving on, we rely on single in situations, exceptions, and anecdotal evidence for our understanding rather than on broad, broader interlocking patterns. So this kind of actually sounds like white, the argument for white privilege. It's not necessarily based in data. It is um, very well based in... Uh, a lot of anecdotal evidence, and she continues to use a lot of anecdotal evidence in this book. People of color are confined and shaped by forces and barriers that are not accidental, occasional, or avoidable. These forces are systemically related to each other in ways that restrict their movement. So here she's saying that black people cannot move they don't have the same mobility as white people. They don't have the, you know, this may be upward income mobility or geographical mobility. And she doesn't believe in individual or she doesn't believe in individualism. So in this, we get the argument that, you know, you know, black people are confined by the system. They cannot escape it on their own. That's sort of the argument she's waking uh, making here. These advantages are referred to as white privilege, a sociological concept referring to advantages that are taken for granted by whites and cannot be similarly enjoyed by people of color in the same context. Um, government, community, workplace, school, etc. Now this it's almost like she's never heard of uh, policies like affirmative action, welfare, more school funding goes to inner city schools than rural schools, at least where I live. Like, I can name a lot of policies that actually Im disparately uh, are meant to help um, um, black Americans more than white Americans. But again, she's talking about systemic laws. I just named some systemic laws that are n not examples of white privilege, would actually refute white privilege. But she doesn't go on to name any corresponding laws. She just assumes that it's a real thing. But let me be clear. Stating racism privileges whites does not, of whites does not mean that individual white people do not struggle or face barriers. Um, she's going to attribute these barriers to classism. Most likely. She goes on to say that reverse racism isn't really a thing. Um, I would actually agree with it just because I don't think we need the qualifier of, of reverse. I, would, I just call it racism. 
by definition, racism is a deeply embedded historical system of institutional power. It is not fluid and does not change direction simply because a few individuals of color manage to excel. So, this is kind of uh, the first hint at her solution to racism, and that is revolution. It's a little hint to it. So, because it is embedded, it does not change, or because a uh, few individuals of color manage to excel. So, basically, um, Barack Obama didn't end racism, which, you know, I would agree with that. But... He held institutional power. She also doesn't believe it's fluid, meaning that if enough uh, black people uh, got into power, they would impose her definition of racism against white people. She doesn't believe that that's possible here either. Whiteness rests upon the foundational on a, upon a foundational premise. The definition of whites as the norm or standard for human. So, and people of color as a deviation from that norm. Wow. Um, hold on, I need to... So the entire concept of being white exists in a belief of superiority uh, over people of color. Whiteness is not acknowledged by white people, and the white reference point is assumed to be the universal, to be universal and is imposed on everyone. Again, this is an entirely racist um, s sentence here. Racist by, you know, normal people's definitions, not her. If you just replace whiteness with blackness, the sentence would be just as racist. So here we get into a discussion on Jackie Robinson. Here she kind of makes the argument that he wasn't really that good at baseball. I mean, yeah, he was good enough to play in the majors, but he wasn't transcendently good, which I would argue that he was so good that he brought down um, the barriers of race in Major League Baseball. She would disagree. She just says that she would – that. Um, Jackie Robinson was allowed to play baseball because so what she's saying here is that Jackie Robinson did not earn um, the ability to play in Major League Baseball. After all, she has already rejected the premise of meritocracy, meaning that Jackie Robinson cannot earn a spot just by being good enough. She rejected that premise already. She was, she says that Jackie Robinson was allowed to play Major League Baseball. Um, this version makes a critical distinction because no matter how fa fantastic a player Robinson was, he simply could not play in a Major League if whites who controlled the institution did not allow it. Were he to walk onto the field being granted permission by white owners and policymakers, or without that, um, the police would have arrested him. So she calls these uh, racial exceptionalities. Uh, this is a new term. And she goes on to suggest that the white people that allow Jackie Robinson to do this did so for ulterior motives. Like money. White history is implied in the absence of his acknowledgement. White history is the norm for history. You know, this is kind of an argument against celebrating black history because if we relegate black history to one month a year, we're also making a distinguishment that it's not part of actual history. We're putting a qualifier on history by calling it black history. If that's the argument, she, I, I don't think that's the argument she's trying to make, but I would kind of agree that we shouldn't um, put qualifiers on history unless it has to do with say Roman history you're describing an event not a uh, race especially since she views race as a co social construct 
So now we're getting into a section on white supremacy. And now she's uh, arguing that our definition of white supremacy isn't good enough. So, you know, normal people believe that white supremacy is, you know, people that believe that white people are the superior race, or that white people are the master race. She calls this a reductive definition and says that, goes on to say that it obscures the reality of a larger system at work and prevents us from addressing the system. So she kind of brands white supremacy as a system in place to maintain the system. The global... The United States is a global power, and through movies, mass media, corporate culture, advertising, U.S.-owned manufacturing, military presence, historical, colonial relations, missionary work, and other means, white supremacy is circulated globally. So she calls all these um, different activities, we'll call it, instances of circulating white supremacy. So if you're a Christian... She is calling missionary work white supremacy here. And yet, I have witnessed this book being pushed in churches. A book that calls missionary work white supremacy. You cannot be a Christian and agree with this statement. It just does not work. And it's historically laughable. Okay, so here we get to a little a, a more fun section. We've had a more uh, anger, I suppose, uh, more wrath at her just negligent arguments and redef uh, redefining of words. But here um, she's going to say she's going to look at the numbers of institutions that uh, she's going to do a break a racial breakdown of who controls certain institutions. I think this is um, a little bit of a fun exercise. So she starts off with um, uh, wealth, then she goes to Congress. I don't know who she counts as what. U.S. governors. Now this is this is my favorite. President and vice president, 100% white. Now let's go back to the year here, 2016 to 2017. You know who was president from January 1st, 2016 to January 1st, 2017, Barack Obama. She accidentally or intentionally, I don't know, she calls Obama white here. Obama's a white man. He's 100% white. Him and Joe Biden, who's also 100% white. Oh, she put the dig in at the Freedom Cost case. I didn't catch that on my first uh, read-through. Where does the 99% come from? I don't think there's 100 members. She's uh, possibly doing some uh, division, biracial division there. Um, people who decide which music is produced, 95% white. I don't necessarily buy that one. Jay-Z, um, Beyonce, they have some clout in what music we hear. Um, certainly the Koreans are getting their music across. So that that's a little section where she tries to go on go on about whites controlling all these institutions. I, I just feel like it's comical like that an editor didn't catch the fact that she calls Barack Obama white. New term for us racial isolation. Okay, so here she goes on another uh, political rant, very partisan one, where she assumes that the white Southern strategy was a real thing. Now note, the South did not consistently vote Republican until George W. Bush. If we look at presidential elections, even, even that hasn't been super stable with uh, Virginia and North Carolina in the last couple cycles. Again, not a very... It's not a historically accurate argument. Now, this isn't a video to explain why the Southern strategy is a myth. Um, perhaps I can put some resources in the description for that. 
Um, she talks about why did busing go in one direction and not the other. Now, I guess she sides more with uh, Kamala Harris in endorsing the process of busing. Now, most people that I've ever heard talk about busing acknowledge the fact that this was a disastrous policy. Like, everyone hated it. But she seems to criticize the fact that it went one way and not the other. I mean, I know from people I've talked to that it did go both ways. Maybe not everywhere, perhaps, but... I certainly know of instances where it did go. White people went to black schools. All right. Um, now we get into. Uh, how we view uh, white and black people. Um, white neighborhoods. Consider how we talk about white neighborhoods. Good, clean, safe, sheltered, clean Desirable. By definition, the other space, not white, are bad, dangerous, crime-ridden, and to be avoided. These neighborhoods are not positioned as sheltered and innocent. Now, she will go on a lot in a lot more uh, exhaustiveness about neighborhood, about neighborhoods. Um, predominantly, white neighborhoods are not outside of race; they are teeming with race. So, she believes that white people live in white neighborhoods because they're racist. Or because of racism. In other words, naming this man's race would be implied. Okay, so this is a more humorous anecdote that she gives. Um, so imagine that a uh, black guy is in a restaurant and you're a white family and your kid points out that the guy is black. You know, that wouldn't be polite, right? So you tell your child not to do that. In other words, naming, but she sees this as saying, we're teaching children that being black is wrong, that there's something wrong with him if he's black, so you shouldn't point that out because we wouldn't point out things that were um, good. Or we only point out things that are good, like you're very tall or handsome or whatever. But pointing out that someone's black and us saying, no, don't do that, means that we think that it's wrong or bad. However, this isn't true. And I don't want to sound crass, but I need to destroy this argument. And the best way to destroy this argument is to say, um, you're at a restaurant with your family, two kids or whatever, and one of your young four-year-old or whatever points out that the wait waitress has big boobs, right? You would have the same reaction. You would say, no, don't say that out loud. Don't say that in public. That's not nice. That's impolite. You would tell your four-year-old that, right? Does that mean that it's bad to, for a waitress to have big boobs? No. No, not at all. But she seems to think that we say, we call this impolite because we believe that there's something sh shameful about being black. That's not the case at all. There's just standards of decorum and what is polite, what is impolite. I believe this little anecdote takes, takes us to the end of the chapter. So, thank you for uh, listening to this edition of our rebuttal of white fragility. I hope you'll... Uh, want to see more of this comment below what you think like and subscribe so you uh, don't miss the next installments thank you for watching this video and have a blessed day